Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, good to see you all. Uh, I'm sure some more students will be joining us. Uh, all right, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Um, Vega, uh, would you mind leading us in prayer, please? Okay. What about uh, Suhasis? Uh, Subasis? Uh, are you around? Okay. Yes, okay. No problem, Bega. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Once again, Lord, thank you for bringing us together to learn more about your word, Lord. I especially pray for Pastor, Lord, as uh, he is teaching, Lord. I pray and especially ask your favor upon him, Lord. Use him, Lord. Uh, speak through him, Master. And I especially pray for all our dear students, Lord, which are joining. Bless us, Lord, uh, so that Lord will have a heart to receive your word and implement in our life, Master. We thank you so much for hearing us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Shivajis. Right. So um, last week, what we did was we looked at, uh, you know, uh, we finished the covenants. Now we've gone into learning on the cross. Uh, we looked at different aspects of the cross. Most importantly, we looked at how Jesus foretells the cross, right? Uh, we learned that, you know, uh, Jesus knew ahead what he came for. He knew his mission. And he said, okay, he kept telling his disciples, one day, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to be with you. There's going to come a time when, uh, you know, I'll be going to the cross. So Jesus knew everything. And so we looked at a few uh, verses from there. Then we looked at, uh, the wisdom of the cross. What did the cross achieve for us? You know, uh, last week we talked about how, when you look at it in the naturally, the cross was a uh, was a horrific place. It was a it's a place of death, bloodshed, uh, and it was not pleasant to look at at all. But the Bible teaches us that there was wisdom in the cross. It was it was a victory in the spiritual realms. Right. In the natural, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans thought, okay, uh, we have you know probably defeated this man and everything is going to end. But in the in the spiritual, there was victory. Colossians chapter one says he disarmed the principalities and the powers of darkness on the cross. Right. And we saw a few uh, important points last week on substitution and how God was a substitute for man, right? And the meaning of substitution is instead of, in place of, in behalf of, and a substitute of, right? So the Lord Jesus, when he was on the cross, it was actually in our place, right? And when God the Father sees us, he sees us through the eyes of Jesus. Right? And that is so wonderful, right? Uh, do we sin? Do we fail? Yes. But the loving heart of the Father is that he sees us through his son, Jesus. And he sees us as justified. He sees us as already cleansed. And so we looked at how the, the whole aspect of the first Adam and the last Adam uh, and how the atonement that is what in the Old Testament, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. This time, the Lord Jesus did it once and for all. So the atonement, the price, complete price was paid. Right? The Bible teaches us that God's wrath, anger upon sickness, upon death, upon Satan, and all the things of, the, of, of sin was put upon the Lord Jesus. Right? Uh, and, and last week, you know, we talked about how the more Jesus thought about that separation of himself with the Father, the more painful it was. Jesus was not afraid of uh, the physical pain. Yes, it may have, you know, it may have crossed through his mind, but the pain of that separation, because from eternity, from the beginning of time, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have been one. Right? There was unity in the Trinity. But now, all of a sudden, on the cross, there's going to be a separation. 
because sin is going to be imparted on Jesus. And so uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was not that Jesus was worried about, okay, the nails that are going to go, they're going to beat me up and they, you know, they're going to uh, nail me to the cross and uh, this is, it's going to be so painful more than the physical aspect. And our Lord Jesus' mind was, I have not tasted, you know, sin. But I have to taste it now. I have not tasted what it feels like to be separated from the Father. But I have to taste it now. That is why he was mentally stressed. And the Bible says that at the Garden of Gethsemane, he, uh, there was drops of blood that was coming uh, as he was praying. And, and so uh, the cross put to death enmity that God had with man. Uh, there was an enmity. Man was rebellious against God. But through the cross, now there's no enmity, right? Uh, God could pardon us all. Uh, he, he, he made redemption for us. And then uh, what he did was he took us from that place of being sinners to a place of being justified. Uh, then we also looked at the power and the blessings of the cross. And what Jesus did on the cross was he broke the sins or, or the power of sin in our lives. Now, uh, let me add this, right? The power of sin in our life has been broken. Now, will there be temptations? Yes. What is it that you and I as believers must do? Right? We must tap into what Jesus did on the cross. What did he do on the cross? He nullified or he annulled the power of sin over our lives. So there is no way that we can say, you know what, I could not overcome that temptation or, you know, uh, I, everyone in this world are sinning. So everyone are, you know, doing these things. So even I'm doing it. Or everyone are, uh, drinking or smoking and doing all these bad habits, watching uh, wrong things, speaking bad words, so even I can do it. Uh, there's no way we can say that because as believers, Christ has broken the power of sin in our lives. So we cannot live in that anymore, right? Uh, on the cross, Jesus Christ annulled Satan's power. And so the blessings of the cross will flow through each one of us, right? So let's go to chapter 20 uh, on your notes. Chapter 20, we're almost coming to a close on uh, the study of the cross. This is a very interesting chapter. Um, from the cross through the throne. From the cross to the throne, right? Now, Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. Yes, could one of us please read that? Luke 23 and verse 43. Luke 23 and verse 43. If any one of us are here with the Bible, please go ahead and read. Jafina, if you uh, have your Bibles with you, can you please read? It's okay. Luke 23, 43. Pastor, shall I read? Yes, please go ahead. Go ahead then. Uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Thank you, Anita. Now, what is the context here? Jesus is on the cross. He's, he's going to die. And we know the story. There's one who ridicules Jesus and the other thief who says, I'm a sinner. Lord, please forgive me. When you enter your kingdom, please remember me. It was a powerful scene. What does Jesus assure this man? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, let us look at what is this paradise, right? Now, the Bible teaches us many things. When you look at the Old Testament, there's a word called Sheol. And then in the New Testament, the Greek word says um, Hades, right? Now, Hades is a place, and Hades is divided into two sections. One section is called paradise, which is Abraham's bosom. 
And this is where the blessed of the Lord, which means those who believed in God before uh, uh, Christ's coming, is a place where they, their souls would be comforted and rested. Right? We know this because Jesus himself said, uh, you know, uh, you will be with me in paradise, right? And we see the, uh, you know, the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, the rich man was in a place of torment, but the but the poor man was in Abraham's bosom, was in paradise, right? So Hades has two parts. One, Abraham's bosom, which is also called paradise. And then the other place is a place of torment, right? Where the souls of, or the spirits of those who, uh, disobeyed, who lived, uh, who did not obey God, who uh, lived, uh, you know, uh, sinful lives. It, there's a other place there where they would be tormented in that place. Now, Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Right. So what happened after Jesus' death? Right. After Jesus died, he went to paradise. Right now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. Let's read that. Ephesians 4, 9 and 10. Yes, anyone? Ephesians 4, 9 and 10. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Right. Thank you, Jafina. So here, what did Jesus do? He who ascended, so he went. He descended. He went into paradise. He preached the gospel. He made himself known and he took, uh, meaning he, he, he let them know. So, for example, there would have been people who are in the old covenant who are there. That's their resting place. He preached the gospel to them. Right. And he let them captive. So. Jesus. So uh, he goes he, uh, after his death, he goes to paradise. He lets them know. Now, what about the place of torment? Jesus in his ministry kept saying, there's going to be those who disobey, there's going to be a lake of fire and they will be thrown into the lake of fire. So right now, there's not much spoken about this place of torment, but we do know in the book of Revelations, we see that death and Hades will give them up, which means what the, the Hades himself, that place will give up those who are, uh, you know, who died without believing in God. And then in, later on in the book of Revelation says, they will be judged in the great white throne judgment and be thrown into the lake of fire. Right. But now, where is Jesus now? Jesus, this whole place of Abraham's bosom in paradise, he has led everyone and taken them up to heaven. Right. What does Paul say? Paul says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul also says in his testimony, he says, I went up to the third heaven and I saw things and I heard things which are inexplainable. So he went up to the third heavens, right? So since the ascension of Christ, right, the Lord Jesus, what did he do? The first thing he he went into paradise, he preached the gospel, he led the captives, and now they are in heaven, right? Uh, so I hope everyone understood this, right? So Hades, there's two parts. One is Abraham's bosom called paradise, and then there is one place called um, uh, a, a place of torment. Now about the place of torment, we know that there's going to be a lake of fire where at the end in the book of Revelations, death and Hades will give them up and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire after the judgment. Now, what is something interesting here? On the resurrection morning, right, when the Lord Jesus resurrected, uh, 
Let's read John chapter 20, 15 to 17. John 20, 15 to 17. Yes, go ahead. Anyone? John chapter 20, 15 and 17. Yes, anyone please read. John 20, chapter, verse 15 and 17, Pastor. Yes, 15 to 17, yes. Okay, it says, John 20, chapter 15, it says, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She surprised, she surprising him to be the gardener, said to her, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to her, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So we see here, the Lord Jesus is resurrected, and uh, Mary is there, Mary Magdalene, and she's uh, she looks at Jesus and she thinks, okay, he must be a gardener. And the moment Jesus says Mary, she recognizes Jesus's voice, and she tries to go and cling on to Jesus. But what does Jesus say uh, in verse seventeen? Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father and to my God and to your God. Right. So what is happening here? Jesus has resurrected, but he has he's telling Mary, don't cling on to me because I've not yet gone to the Father. Right. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, eight days later. From this moment on, eight days later, all the disciples are gathered and there's the doubting Thomas there. Many of them came during those eight days. Many of them say, you know, we saw Jesus, we saw Jesus. But Thomas says, no, until I see him, until I touch his wounds and touch his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, all the believers, uh, all the disciples are together and Jesus appears to them. Let's see what happens. John chapter 20, 26 to 28. Yes, let's read that. John chapter 20, 26 to 28. Okay, I'll read that. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came. The doors were being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it on my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Right now you look at these two events that happen. Jesus resurrected. Mary Magdalene sees Jesus, goes to cling Jesus, but Jesus says, don't come near me. Don't cling on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Eight days later, the disciples are together. Jesus meets with them, says, peace be unto you. He tells Thomas, come and touch me. Come and touch my hands. Come and touch my side. And you will know that flesh and blood, uh, a spirit does not have these things, but I am flesh and blood right now. So what happened during these eight days? It is most likely that during these eight days, Jesus ascended to the presence of the Father. And what did he do when he ascended there? He carried his own blood into the Holy of Holies, into the heavenly temple, and made atonement for the sacrifice. Now you picture this, right? If you look at the old covenant temple look at the heavenly temple they are exact replicas right now in the old covenant we all know right we studied it where the high priest would take the blood once a year pour it on the altar and say lord this is atonement for the sins of myself and for the sins of my people nation of israel 
Now, what does Jesus do? He goes to the Father, into God's presence. He takes his own blood and makes atonement. Isn't that powerful? Uh, the Son of God, he came down from heaven, lived this perfect life, died as a, uh, you know, died on the cross as a convict, yet God raised him from the dead. He takes his own blood and sheds it and shows it to the Father and says, I have made atonement. The high priest, what he did was never done before. Having entered once, once for all, the price was paid. Jesus doesn't have to come every five years to be and show the blood to the Father to remind the Father, Father, look, uh, you know, it's been quite some time now. I hope you remember the sacrifice that I made on the cross. No, he doesn't have to remind him. You know, he, Jesus doesn't have to say, okay, every 500 years I have to remind the Father. No, the price was paid once and for all. The high priest through the offering of his body and blood, opened the way so that we all can enter the Holy of Holies. Remember in the Old Covenant? God didn't let everyone, all the Israelites to come in. No, there was a restriction. You got to stay in the outer courts, come in near the inner courts, but you cannot go into the Holy of Holies. But now, because of what Jesus did, we can, you know, uh, enter in. So between those eight days, Jesus went up, most probably. He went and he offered his blood. What did he do after that? Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he showed himself alive. Let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. Yes, any one of us, please read. 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 3 to 8. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the script scripture said he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said he was seen by peter and then by the twelve after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive though some have died then he was seen by james and later all by the apostles lost of all as though i had been born at the wrong time i also saw him Amen. yeah thanks Yafina. so he showed himself alive, right? Now, we know that uh, they were walking on the road to Emmaus. Jesus began to uh, expound the scriptures. They were worried. Uh, haven't you heard? Are you new to this place? They crucified the Son of God. Uh, they crucified this man named Jesus. He claimed to be the Messiah. He did these wonderful miracles. He healed the blind. He healed the lepers. Uh, he was a good man. He, he did good things, but they crucified him. I knew to uh, Jerusalem. And Jesus just kept saying, don't you see? Oh, but this is what the scripture says. This is what the scripture says. And Jesus began to expound to them the scripture. Right. And when they went, they reached, they said, OK, uh, whoever you are, don't go away. Come and sit with us and keep telling us what you know from, uh, you know, you've been teaching us. And the moment he began to reveal himself through the scriptures, their hearts knew that he was the Messiah. And they discussed among themselves, saying, didn't our heart burn when he was teaching us, when he was speaking to us? He showed himself alive. He showed himself alive to the disciples. He didn't, you know, here's the wonderful part. Jesus was not afraid to show himself alive, right? He was not like, oh, what if the Romans, you know, uh, catch me again? Or what if the Romans, uh, you know, or some people say, spread some false news that I'm not, you know, it was somebody else on the cross. He was unafraid. Why was that? Because Jesus knew what he did. 
he knew he had died he knew that he took the sins of the world upon him he knew that he took, went up to the cross and he went up to heaven he made that eternal sacrifice unto the father as a great high priest and he came back and he was confident right picture this if you and i are confident right uh, for example in our ministry or, or in our workplace in our studies you know example we've written our exams right and we know we've not cheated or we know we've done well in the exam we are confident right but the moment we if we have cheated or by wrong means done our exam and then we get our answer papers we are very fearful or there's some kind of guilt inside right oh, uh, you know uh, i should have shouldn't have done this or i i could have just studied and read it. there's some kind of guilt but jesus did not have that when he was alive he showed him so he was not hiding behind the trees or behind the tombs and saying okay uh, i hope nobody sees me no he revealed himself to more than 500 people the verse that we just read then he revealed himself to his disciples the apostles he revealed himself to his own half brother james i wonder what james would have thought he would have thought you know lord jesus i'm sorry i should have believed you uh from the time we were small we were together but i didn't believe you but now i believe you he showed himself he revealed himself and the disciples later on saw him go up to heaven right they saw him with his own eyes they saw the lord jesus resurrect and go up to heaven right so what does it show us jesus is alive right he didn't just defeat death uh, but he overcame death he he when he died and he resurrected from the dead it's like telling death paul writes it beautifully he says death where is your sting where's your sting there's no more sting of death death is painful but there's no sting because if you read the verses before that paul writes who can separate us from the love of christ neither angels nor demons nor uh, uh any barriers nothing can separate us from the love of christ is there going to be a natural death yes but the lord jesus is assuring us that you will be alive you will live right the lord jesus his physical body was you know transformed into this glorified body right the same thing is going to happen to us when you read the book of revelations our spirit in uh, is going to rejoin with our spirit and we'll get a glorified body right we can recognize each other they recognize jesus and he showed himself alive so that's why paul writes to timothy he says this wonderful thing he says we have one mediator between god the man jesus christ do you ever wonder why why Paul wrote that the man Jesus Christ because if you if you have one mediator between God the God Jesus Christ then it's like God mediating for God but who will mediate for man so he's emphasizing saying it was a man who was God who became man just like you and me in our likeness tempted in every way went through all the challenges that we went through the man Jesus Christ is now the mediator you know many of them ask me this sometimes we do these sessions in uh, eschatology which is end times and we study about it and people ask us uh, you know uh, how is it can we see jesus uh, can we see him in his you know get to know how he looks and all of those things and it's very interesting to know that the glorified body if we read the book of revelation chapter 1 it talks about how the lord jesus looks right it says that when john he's writing this he he looks at this in the vision he sees jesus and he sees the glorified jesus he says his eyes were like blazing fire his hair was white as wool his feet like burnished grass and out of his mouth came the double edged sword and when john the disciple who would always put his head on jesus's bosom all through the three and a half years of his ministry when john saw that he fell at jesus's feet as if dead because the glory of god was revealed in him 
right? And so right now he has ascended on high. No more is Jesus, you know, this poor little lamb, you know, just walking about. Oh, uh, who was, you know, uh, yes, he is the lamb, but he's also the lion. No more is Jesus meek, meaning he's no more, you know, uh, uh, like what he was before. He's gone back to the Father in all his glory. And that is a great assurance for all of us, right? That you and I, as his believers, people may say, this man is dead and gone. Jesus was crucified. He had a humiliating death. He's dead and gone. Let's carry on with our lives. Nobody's going to believe him. But here's the truth. You and I as believers, when we receive the Lord Jesus, when we believe in the work of the cross, we are his children. We will see him in his glory. That's a, That should be our assurance. Death is no longer a stink. Yes, it's painful to lose a loved one. But we have this hope that we will see each other again, that death is not the end. So that's wonderful. Right now, Jesus is seated on the highest throne. Let's read Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. And somebody else can also read Mark 16, 19. Right. Acts 1, 9 to 11. Yes, could anyone please read? Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Let's go ahead. Anyone? Acts chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why are you standing here? Start staring into heaven. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Evan, thank you, Jafina. Anyone please read Mark 16, 19? Mark 16, 19. So, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. Thank you, Anita. So these two verses very clearly says that, you know, Jesus was taken up. There were witnesses, right? And they were seeing Jesus taken up into the clouds. And in the clouds, they saw two men robed in white saying, don't be alarmed. The same Jesus who's going up, he's going up to heaven right now. But there will come a time he will come back, right? And then uh, uh, Mark 16, 9, 19 again, uh, talking about how you know, uh, Jesus is now resurrected and he is seated on the right hand of the Father. And the Father does something wonderful. He says, now all power, all dominion belongs to the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is God. He's seated. He's gone back to his rightful place. He came. He did the work. He accomplished his task and he went back to the Father's presence. And now there's no other name than the name of Jesus. So we see that the cross is not just an event that we celebrate on Good Friday. Or the cross is not something we think of only during the Lord's table. No. The cross, the aspects, the attributes, the power of the cross is 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 always there working in our lives every day of our life and we can tap into that power we have it it's available all we have to do is access it say god let the power of your cross come and pour into my life 
right? Let's go to chapter 21, the power of his resurrection. Now, one of the greatest testaments of uh, testimonies of uh, to the resurrection of Christ is the fact that Jesus still works in our lives and still working miracles all across the world. What happened if Jesus died? He didn't resurrect. It would have been just uh, another good story of a great prophet who came and died. But Jesus resurrected. Now, what happened if Jesus died, resurrected, and didn't do anything after that? It's like, okay, I came, I did my work, and now I've resurrected, I've gone back to the Father. No. We see that the greatest testimonies of the resurrection of Christ is that his power is still working right now, you know, where there are miracles happening all across the world. You know, when we when we look at history, we see the wonderful ways that the Lord Jesus, the word of God, the, uh, the power of the name of Jesus has healed people, has delivered people. Uh, and when we look at the early church and you look at even now across the world, right, this, this gospel is bearing fruit. Can you picture this? The disciples are 12 of them. And Jesus is telling the disciples, go and preach. And you will be preaching to all across the nations, across Judea, across Samaria, across the world. And all the whole world will come to know about what has been done to mankind. Now picture the disciples. They were thinking, oh my God. We can't travel more than 100 miles away from Jerusalem. How is it that this gospel is going to reach all across the world? Okay, Judea, Samaria, okay, we can manage. They're around us we, and they know about, uh, you know, they have seen uh, Jesus and they've seen the miracles that he has done. Okay, they may believe. But how about the world? Who's going to go to Greece? Who's going to go to uh, these other countries, Asia, Europe? Who's going to go there? The African continent? Who? How is it going to go across the world? But when you look at it now, the gospel has spread across the entire world. And it's going to continue to spread. And God is going to continue to work miracles. Why? Because his resurrection power is working in amongst us. It's not like he's resurrected and gone and now we have to do all the work. No. His power is working. Resurrection power of the early church, we've seen, uh, there are a lot of examples, but remember Peter and John, they go to pray and they met this lame man. The lame man says, can you please give me some money? And he looks at Peter and John's hands, supposing that they were going to give him some money. But Peter and John say, listen, silver and gold I don't have. But what I have, I'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Right? Can you picture that scene? Which Jesus Christ of Nazareth? The one who was crucified? I'm sure that lame man would have uh, thought of that. The one who died between two criminals? Yes, that same man. In that name, the resurrection power of Christ. In that name, rise up and walk. Now, this man had two choices. He could have said, I'm not going to get up from that. You know, he died as a criminal. I might as well. I'm a good man. I'm just begging. I'm asking for arms. I'm not a criminal. But this man took the other option and he said, okay, I believe in that name. If you want me to stand, let me try and stand. What happened? Peter and John helped him stand. He rose up from his bed. He took up his mat and he walked. Where was Jesus that time? He's in heaven. But his resurrection power is working. Right? Did Peter and John think that they would be doing miracles this way? Not really. Peter was a fisherman. But did they see the miracles Jesus did? Yes. What happened? They began to understand. Okay. If Jesus is resurrected, he's alive, his power can continue to work in us. And then Peter, the same Peter who was fearful, who was scared of the Romans and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, 
he stands in the temple and he preaches the sermon. And he, what does he say after that? He says, why do you all look at us as if this is something new? The one whom you crucified, the one whom you killed, has now risen. He has defeated death and he's alive. And it is by that name that this man is walking. It's not about me. You know I'm a fisherman. But it is that resurrection power that is working. Right? And when you look at the great apostle Paul, a man who didn't even get to meet the Lord Jesus, but he did so much for God's kingdom. Uh, the miracles. And when he reached the island of Malta, that snake just coiled around his hand and he shook off that snake. The Eutychus, the little that boy who was sitting in the window fell off and he was dead. Paul goes and just prays and he's brought back to life. Many, many, many testimonies. Even now, the resurrection power of Christ is working. The resurrection power is the best part. Is It's not available only for the 12 disciples. Jesus didn't say only you 12. You know, you are the ones who are with me during the 30, you know, three and a half years. You were the one with me. So I will pour it out to you alone. No. First, it was the 120 people in the upper room. Then from there, it went on. It just spread out thousands and thousands of people, all believers. The resurrection power of God is exerted on all of us as believers. And it is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead can give, grant us power to work miracles. right? And so when we as believers really think about this cross and what Jesus achieved on the cross, Right? Our whole understanding changes. The resurrection power through the Holy, through the power of the Holy Spirit has been made available for each one of us. So what is the enemy doing against you? What is he doing? He's bringing circumstances, bringing challenges, bringing fear, doubt, anxiety, failure, hopelessness suicidal tendencies, anger, jealousy, pride, all of these are the works of the enemy, right? Now, there is power that is available through the cross, through the Holy Spirit. The, the power is available in us to stop the work of the enemy in our lives. It's available, but we have to use it, right? There are many testimonies that I can share about people who have been addicted to drugs for many years and in a moment they have given it up because of the resurrection power of Christ. There are people who have been blind, deaf. In a moment, the power of God has touched them and that what they couldn't do for years or from their birth, they were able to do it. And this resurrection power is available for all of us. All of us have that. Right? Yeah, you don't have to wait to become a pastor. You don't have to wait to become an evangelist or let me wait till I start my ministry. Uh, let me wait till I start prophesying. No, you don't have to wait. It's made available. Now, the key is that we must draw from it. If I want to hear God, what must I do? If I want to hear what God is speaking to me, yes, I can read his word. What, my, what else I must do? If I want to have a relationship with somebody, the most important thing to do is to talk to them. And prayer is what? You're talking to God. You know, there are times when I've just spoken to God in the sense that I just said, I just said things like, God, help me to, you know, wake up in the morning. Or God, help me to, you know, I'm going to go now. You know, I'm just having this relationship with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm going now. Uh, if there's somebody on the way that you want me to minister to, show me. Lead me to the right people. Or uh, Holy Spirit, uh, I'm feeling very tired. Now, can you give me some strength? I need your strength. I'm feeling physically tired, mentally tired. I'm feeling weak. Holy Spirit, just give me strength. You know, sometimes we look at, you know, Prayer as a place where, you know, you have to close the door, lock the door, kneel down, 
uh, and you have to pray. Yes, there's a place for that. But our God is a God of relationships. Right? He understands. Right? So, uh, sometimes I, uh, you know, I, I'll be playing the guitar and I don't get a chord and I keep saying, God, what do you think the chord can be? You know, it may sound silly, right? I try figuring it out. Finally, I'm, I may get the chord, right? Could have been some random chord. So you and I, Jesus teaches us. He says, uh, my sheep hear my voice. Are we his sheep? Yes. Then we must hear his voice. But why, why is it sometimes we don't hear? Because we have built a wall. The Lord has not built it. We have built the wall. A wall of sin around us. And so the Holy Spirit or Jesus is speaking to us from the other side. But the wall is obstructing. And we're not able to hear. You know, Jesus is saying, uh, why don't you do this? But there's a wall there in front of us. We're not able to hear. We need to break that wall of sin. Only then we are able to hear what the Lord Jesus is speaking to us. What is important is also knowing his power, knowing the power of his resurrection and unlocking it in our lives. Right? And I'm sure all of us know his resurrection power, has experienced his resurrection power through many areas in our lives. Um, and we continue in that, continue to grow, continue to have faith, trust God that he will you know, continue to move in our lives. Right, So it's so wonderful uh, what Jesus did on the cross for us. All right, let's take a break uh, of 10 minutes. We'll come back at 11 o'clock and uh, we'll do a little more on the next chapter. Right, let's take a break. <laughs> 